expect the unexpected, expect a huge amount of downside, but also expect a huge amount of upside. Hello, and welcome to this new episode of The Money Movement. I'm really pleased today to be joined by Felix Salmon, who is the Chief Financial Correspondent for Axios, uh, a a longstanding uh, and prolific journalist, uh, covers uh, all things markets and the economy, but really uh, a a thoughtful person on many, many topics, and really excited to talk with him about um, a number of topics, but really anchored in um, his new book, the Phoenix Economy. So, uh, w- welcome to the to the program, Felix. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, it's it's great to have you here. Um, so, I just thought it'd be it'd be interesting to start just with a little bit about the the book as a whole, and and you know, I, I think uh, you had some high level concepts that I think are interesting, which is you know, we've had all of these unexpected things happen as a result of COVID. And you know, one big theme here is sort of the unexpected isn't over, and we're still living with this huge evolution in the whole way the world works, in a sense. And and in a sense, this thesis that kind of COVID precipitated a whole new era, and sort of zooming out from a historical epical kind of perspective, like it's precipitated this whole new era. Um, obviously, I'm I'm being extremely simplistic in 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 uh, in in that kind of high level summary, but I no, you, you nailed just, it. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Uh, um, I, I'd love for you to just start with, you know, in your words, um, the, the kind of walk through the overall or the kind of the, the whole thesis here, uh, just to kick things off. So basically, the thesis is that we had 70 years of peace and relative stability from call it 1946 to 2015. And that was an era when you could do the Warren Buffett thing. You could set your eyes on the prize and say, I'm just going to make a big leveraged bet on America being great. And you could become the richest man in the world by doing that. Um, That was the era of long-term plans and strategy. And it turns out that if you look at history beyond the previous you know 75 years um that's not how history normally works it has rarely been the case that people have been able to make long-term plans you know we it has never been the case up until the most recent century that we went 100 years without a global pandemic we are now i think moving into a much more volatile world a much more unpredictable world and one which is in fact more similar to the world that we had before 1945 than the world that we had after 1945. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I mean, remember that just in that span of 30 years, basically from 1914 to 45, we had two major seismic world wars. Um, crazy things can and will happen. Expect the unexpected, expect a huge amount of downside, but also expect a huge amount of upside. And one of the big sort of optimistic less and one of the big optimistic themes of the book i would say is that when you have a lot of risk when you have a lot of volatility the the most you can lose is 100 percent, but the most you can gain is unlimited and so the gains ultimately wind up often being bigger than the losses even when the losses are enormous yeah it's uh it's 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 uh it's a you know, I, I think very compelling uh, thesis. I think people um, kind of feel it in their guts uh, a little bit. Uh, I think you know when when out in the world interacting, you know, kind of the the degree of uncertainty uh, is just it's really deeply felt. I mean, I, I think uh, we see that everywhere, and and kind of a, a feeling of the the superstructures that existed, uh, the, those persistent superstructures that existed. Um, Kind of falling apart or reconfiguring, or you know, and and not really knowing what's gonna what's gonna um, uh, uh, emerge. Um, it, it's it sounds a uh, um, you know a, a little bit like uh, s- some of the super cycle you know uh, thesis that Ray Dalio talks about, and and that's very specific to uh, kind of the rise and fall of currencies and empires and uh, and all of that but these sort of epical shifts in 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 the international 
economic order. Um, but but your book talks about a lot of things, right? Your your book talks about uh, about about health and education and arts and culture and political organization and money, uh, which we'll we'll come back to. Um, touches on a, on a lot of themes, uh, and and again coming back to this uh, concept of of. Um, you know, expecting dramatic sh- that some of the dramatic changes that happened during the height of the pandemic to kind of have these cascading implications in these areas. Maybe you could just talk for a minute about some of the the biggest themes um, that you think we're still in the early innings of, but you you feel like are are, are part of this um, this this kind of new era. Sure. So there's there's a lot of them. Um, one of the ones which I'm sure we're going to come back to is the way that the dollar seems to be less of a sort of bedrock than it used to be. It's become more politicized. Um, but there are many others. So the obvious one that I think everyone kind of understands is the way that work from home and remote work has changed the way we live our lives. Um, I think people don't realize how much happier it's made us. There's been a few surveys coming out saying that never in the history of surveys have people been happier in their jobs than they are right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the things that it did is that it took a huge amount of the value that was in commercial real estate in office buildings and basically transferred it into residences that people needed effectively office space in their Mm -hmm. residences. Um, The, the way that we architect our buildings these days is much more focused on spaces where we can have privacy than it is focused on, you know, big cathedral ceilings and three car garages and the kind of things that we remember from the 80s and 90s and 2000s, right? So houses are different. Um, and those changes last for a really long time. I tell in the book the story of the um downstairs washroom if you walk into an american house there is an extremely good chance that shortly after you walk in the front door there's going to be a little downstairs bathroom where you can you know go to the toilet and wash your hands um that didn't exist before 1918 that mm-hmm. was that was a that was a creature of the first pandemic where mm-hmm. people were like in order to prevent the spread of germs everyone walking into the house should wash their hands before like you know doing anything else and people discovered that it was actually incredibly convenient to have bathrooms downstairs right. and so then that caught on and, and it never went away but those kind of profound architectural changes are, are definitely going to happen i think on a more uh sort of mental level there's been an increase in compassion i think that we all had a kind of mini mental health crisis over the course of the pandemic uh we don't all remember it because one of the symptoms of trauma is memory loss and we have actually put a lot of the worst of the pandemic kind of out of our minds but we all went through it and i think on some level we all understand how mental health is just a really profound and important thing that shouldn't be stigmatized in the way that it historically has been and i think that if you look at say the prince harry memoir which mm. is the fastest selling nonfiction book in the history of publishing. Mm. Um, that one of the main reasons for that is that people really felt that they wanted to embrace someone who was talking very openly about, about mental health issues. So yeah, there's a bunch of these sort of deep changes that are happening in the world, but a lot of them I don't even attempt to predict. I don't, I, this is not a book of predictions. Um, it's much more a book about the sort of, sort of meta predictions of like, mm-hmm. you know, expect the unexpected and you just, we, we're not going to be able to know things mm-hmm. in the, in the future, in the way that we have known things in the past. Um, the, the era of true believers is probably over and you need to be able to sort of update your priors and be a lot of, a lot more nimble these days because even if something was true yesterday, that doesn't mean that it's still true today. Yeah. I think, um, I, 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 again, feel it in the gut. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real feeling. Um, 
I, I think one of the laddering off of the commentary about the restructuring of of our of our our living space and our health and the relationship we have to work, um, which is, I agree, totally profound and um and has been you know broadly very very positive uh at least in in my survey of the people that i deal with i mean my company for example is 100 percent remote um we don't have any offices we just opened an office in singapore i should say because they all wanted to go to an office in in a city state and they're all in small apartments or whatever so there are some but like basically it's almost a thousand people and we're just all over the place and 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 it's and it works but um uh, you know, th- it, it ties into this kind of broader theme that you also touch on, which is sort of um, the, the the virtual existence, the digital existence, this huge acceleration and and, and transformation in 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 our experiences of our identities um, in 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 sort of this um, you know, more accelerated digital context, and and that sort of you know leads into a little bit of maybe thinking about the future of money, thinking about the future of work, thinking about the future of collective interaction organization, which, which I really want to turn to. And, um, you know, I, I guess maybe just starting, obviously, given the, the overall kind of theme of this podcast, um, you know, there's a, a lot of discussion about, you know, people's notions of money. And we've certainly, you know, seen that. I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know, the, the kind of birth of 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 cr- cryptocurrency some 12 years ago 13 years ago but then sort of the various bouts of growth in the thinking about money like you know pr- prior to the past certainly the past 5 years um but certainly it's accelerated over the past few years you know it wasn't normal for people to be talking about fiat like fiat is now like a word that people use all the time um, and, and I think largely that's existed, that's come about because alternative currency models that are not fiat or go back to a, a world that's before fiat or different iterations of fiat. Like it, it just, it didn't, it didn't, it was not a popular concept. Um, I mean, obviously if you studied economics, uh, you, you understood it or monetary anything, you understood it. Um, but, not a not a popular concept, but now it's 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 more popular. People throw that word around like crazy, and it, it and it is emblematic of a a world where people everywhere are their relationship to money is really changing, and and there's generational components of that clearly that are that are more profound. And and you talk about the 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 uh, the kind of level of risk taking uh, that exists for certain generations and their relationship to money as it, as it's different but maybe just in this theme um maybe you could just talk a little bit about this relationship to the very idea of money and how that's changed for people and accelerated the ch- the change around that has accelerated i, I do want to get into the dollar itself and the geoeconomics and all the global shifts and what does that mean as well but maybe just maybe starting at this more abstract uh level yeah, I, I think especially in your world, um, the word fiat is mostly used in a slightly or explicitly pejorative sense. That people think that if a currency can just be created by fiat, um, by the whim of a government, um, then in a world of high volatility in in you know the new not normal where governments can rise and fall obviously currencies can and will as well and that there's something bad about fiat currency and so you do get these you know um bitcoin true believers and so forth who think that there's there's something good so the, about, the austrian economic sound money theorists uh yeah kind of view view yeah. the world so that pre pre-1945 it was supposed to be the gold standard and obviously there were deviations from that over a long period but sure. um, yeah so yeah so um so yeah so that idea that that fiat is untrustworthy is one obviously as you say that has been around a very long time that got a lot of traction in during the the rise of bitcoin and then 
but then like was still largely theoretical until the pandemic hit. And then something very interesting happened during the pandemic, especially in the United States, which was that almost everyone in America woke up one morning and discovered $1,400 in their bank account that wasn't there the day before. It had just like magically appeared there and the government had you know, put it in there. And they were very happy about that. And they went out and they spent it and they did crazy things with it and they bought NFTs and, you know, they, they had a lot of fun and we had that crazy meme stock winter of 2021. But the weirdly magical appearance of those $1,400, which didn't just happen once, it happened multiple times, um, did drive home to people how sort of contingent and at the whim of the government money really is. Yeah. And you could and you could see that also in the way that the US government just basically vaporized the entire foreign reserve stack of Russia, you know, after it invaded Ukraine. And so people are like, oh, you know, that now there are, you know, if you are in the crypto world, you're going to look at these kind of things and think, well, that's bad. It means that fiat currencies are weak and therefore my thing that I believe in is better in comparison. I I don't think that was the broader reaction. I, I do think there are genuine upsides to the fact that the U.S. government can is willing and able to use the dollar and its power over the dollar to prosecute, you know, fiscal policy in the face of a pandemic or foreign policy in the way in the face of Russia invading Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it doesn't just sit there and pretend that the dollar is this immutable yeah. thing. And in fact, it goes out and, and uses it in, in the service of its its aims. And in, in both cases, in the case of like the, the fiscal stimulus and in the case of um, punishing Russia, I think those aims were broadly agreed upon by by nearly all Americans. So the power of fiat currency and the upside of having control over fiat currency also became clear during the pandemic. And I think that, and then combine that with the crypto winter, and you start to understand why whatever sort of warm, fuzzy feelings that Washington was having towards crypto pre-pandemic whatever feelings there might have been, did somewhat evaporate when they realized, you know, on some level that they actually wanted and needed um, the power they have of, over the dollar and that fiat currencies can actually be a really good thing. Yeah, I mean, c- clearly um, the, the, the global view on this has evolved a lot. And, 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 um, I think that's one of been, been one of the more remarkable things that I've been seeing over the past, um, over the past year in particular, post the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, is, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll come back to the, the geoeconomic, geopolitical things in a moment, but it's, it's been fascinating to see everywhere in the world, um, the sort of conception of the, political basis of money. Um, and, you know, I think for people who cover global macro and who cover geopolitics and so on, that's been a, a dialogue for some time, the rise of China and its ambitions and the like. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's, I've, I've, I've just seen that whole discussion accelerate in a way that I haven't seen in, in a really long time. Um, and, uh, and so, we'll, you know, that's the politi- polit- politicization, weaponization, you know, what, what, what are these shifting new geoeconomic blocks? What does that mean? But, but coming back to the kind of conceptions, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to see because of, of inflation, uh, again, an, an, a more general awareness of, you know, this money that came kind of came out of nowhere and created, you know, this, this new phenomenon, which actually is eroding wealth, um, more awareness on, on things like that. And, you know, I, I think it's, fa- it's fascinating as well. Um, and, and it has not pierced through quite as much, but the current situation, uh, of, you know, the government's bankrupt. It's run out of money. It keeps running out of money. It keeps creating money. 
uh, and we keep rising the debt ceiling, which is effectively, you know, a, a per- permission to issue more, you know, money um, in the form of of debt. Uh, and there, there is more popular awareness around this kind of, you know, uh, as people like to say, the dollar is the full faith and credit. But, I mean, the, 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 but the, the United States remains the global hegemon, which is precisely why the government is not bankrupt, right? The, sure, the, sure. the you know, like so long as you can issue unlimited amounts of debt in your own currency, you can never be bankrupt. And the debt ceiling is this ludicrous thing, which makes right. serves no purpose except for to just destabilize the world ever even further. Um, and yeah, so like. I, I, you know, I do think again, like the debt ceiling is a reminder of how sort of weirdly fragile and contingent all of this stuff is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, you know, I think that one of the things we learned during the pandemic was the awesome power of fiscal policy. And I have a chapter in the book about how one of the great heroes of the pandemic was Steve Mnuchin, who was this, you know, like superhero film producer and, you know, superhero. Uh, Treasury Secretary, who just came out and spent trillions of dollars in a way that, um, you know, his his predecessors during the Great Recession of 2008 were felt incapable of doing, to enormously positive and successful effect. People are like, oh, wow, like, we we have this power, we can use it, we should use it. Bring the bazookas, uh, uh, Henry Paulson, uh, lesson learned, let's go. Right, (laughs) exactly. Totally, totally, yeah. Yeah, no, very, very clearly. I mean, it was the, the, the execution of fiscal power was awesome in the face of, uh, of that. And, uh, uh, and, and, and clearly, um, and explains, know. and explains why, you know, Germany's in a recession right now. Right. And because they didn't do that. And the United States has, has, yeah. you know, record low unemployment is just looking pretty healthy. Right. Right. Totally. Um, you know, as, as someone who, uh, Whose core business is the dollar franchise, <laughs> um, uh, where you know our our reason for existence is frankly to expand and ex- and extend and drive uh, you know f- f- further adoption of the dollar in 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 what we we believe is a technologically superior form. Um, you know we're very dollar aligned <laughs> um, in in what we do. And, uh, and, and but I, it, I have a question for you though. Like, sure. uh, are you not really a creature of the zero interest rate environment where people didn't really care whether their dollars were earning interest or not back when interest rates were at zero? And now, as we've seen with, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and all the rest of it, like anything that isn't earning interest is vulnerable to a flight to stuff that is earning interest. You know, when treasury bonds are yielding 5%, suddenly that's a huge opportunity cost of holding something that is yielding zero. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, um, um, you know, when 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 the cost of capital uh, and, and, and the relative opportunity cost of that capital is sort of zero, right, um, you just have higher velocity of money everywhere. Um, whether it's a digital currency form of money or, or commercial electronic, commercial bank electronic money or a- any of the above, right? You just see this velocity, uh, that's, that's happening. And then when, you know, you, you see kind of re- a restrictive environment, there's more money at rest. Um, and the money at rest is sort of parking itself in, in as, you know, uh, low risk, high return kind of mechanism as possible. And that's, that's obviously had an impact in drawdowns on stable coins. But it's also had a huge impact on drawdowns on bank deposits. In you, you can look at that in terms of aggregate growth of you know money market funds uh, in recent periods. In particular, it's been it's been pretty dramatic, right? So I think it's all that's all part of that thing. But I, I think um, you, you know I, I guess our view and our and our approach is um, we're we're thinking about um, payment system um, you know payment system innovation and you know fundamentally what does um, what's the right structure for cash or cash equivalent, digital cash equivalent um, fiat monetary instruments, um, and uh, and and how those can be widely widely used in a high velocity way in a huge array of different 
financial, commercial, and, and other applications. And that construct, which is sort of the essence of a stablecoin, um, you know, needs to be um, as simple and safe as possible. It should not have a lot of embedded risk. It should be the most low risk thing uh, possible. Um, and you know, o- only in that basis where you have a the, the the working capital, meaning capital that needs to be at work and and utilized, um, you know, shouldn't be in a in a money at rest situation. It should be in a in a kind of high velocity payment um, uh, or- oriented infrastructure. And and so we're we're big believers in um, a kind of the separation of um, kind of. Uh, base layer of money payment systems from lending money and investment money and uh and so that's sort of a, a broader kind of future architecture of of how to construct um you know the financial system and banking and the like but longer discussion um <laughs> for sure uh, yeah. Uh, yeah but but like i think when you go back to to geopolitics um i think what one of the really interesting things we learned um, in 2022 was precisely this distinction between architecture and plumbing, which I think people had forgotten about a lot, right. and they often mistook plumbing for architecture, mm-hmm. which is why when we threatened, when we were talking for a couple of weeks about, you know, we might do be so bold as to cut Russia off from SWIFT, mm-hmm. that was always referred to as the nuclear option right right um because it was considered to be just so such a profoundly damaging thing and then we did it and the consequences were frankly negligible and everyone basically woke up in the morning after we cut off russia from swift and said oh we mistook plumbing for architecture and if russia can't use the swift plumbing they're just going to use some other form of plumbing instead mm-hmm. yeah i mean this 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 whole you know, theme, which I was also touching on of, you know, the dialogue around, um, you know, basically alternative currency systems and alternative, um, alternative payment systems, the intensity of focus on that, my, my experience at least is, is far, far greater than it's ever been. There was always talk about this in the past. Um, but talk is, it's not just talk anymore. It's, it's, it's really action. And I refer to this a little bit, uh, uh, to, to, to be like kind of the frog in the boiling water, which is, you know, you, you know, these things are happening. Uh, there, there are these things happening. Um, and, you know, they're going to, the heat will continue to turn up. It's, it, and, and does feel like to, to the broader thesis of your book is like we're ending a 75 year era. And we're entering a new era, and that new era is being reorganized around very different geoeconomic blocks, uh, geopolitical blocks. Still not sure what those the shape of all of those are going to be. We can we can reason about it clearly, um, and um, and and very concerted efforts to uh, to build you know monetary infrastructure that is resilient from. Uh, you know, the U S and its core Western allies and, and, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not black and white, right? It's cause clearly like the, the, inter- yeah, I mean, if, if I, this is, is this is not, this is not a book of predictions at all. And I, you know, one of my things is to, to expect the unexpected. So if, if that were to happen, if, if a U S proof monetary infrastructure were to develop, like then I could easily sort of trace that back to the new not normal and the and the big changes that were wrought by the pandemic. That said, I, I personally am boring and conservative and neoliberal enough to believe that's not going to happen in our lifetimes. Um yeah, I just I just can't see it. The strength of the dollar for all that it's been through various things that have sort of conceptually weakened it, um, is still paramount nothing is coming in close and the power of the institutions that exist to um to shore up is is still incredibly strong and i'm reminded of 12 years ago maybe like there there were thereabouts when bitcoin was just getting started a bunch of people basically said, well, obviously the U.S. government is just going to come down and crush it and make it illegal because there's right. 
language in the constitution saying that you can't have any um, legal currency that isn't the dollar. Um, and so if you're going to try and build up Bitcoin as an alternative currency, that like that's clearly yeah. an unconstitutional thing. And I think everyone was surprised. Certainly I was surprised that there was no real effort on the part of the US government to do that. Mm -hmm. They kind of just allow to do whatever it is it did. And one of the reasons they allowed it was because they found it so incredibly unthreatening. But if they ev if it ever becomes a threat, then they have all the power in the world to just crash it. Yeah, I mean, you certainly see regimes that have capital controls, uh, capital control regimes have undertaken those kinds of of of, of legal steps uh, with various levels of prosecution and and the like. And the the incentives are different if you're if you're in the United States and you're a dollar user, the incentives are different um, than than if you're uh, in Argentina and uh, and whatnot. But um, I think um, you know the 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 um, you know, one one of the things that I think ties also to some of the themes in in your book as well is, um, you know, th again the the changing relationship that people around the world are having with digital money, um, and you know the the sort of um, as I think about at least the future and and what could emerge is we're we're sort of entering an era where um, you know certainly for significant cohorts of of people. Um, they've kind of come to understand that they can kind of participate in different forms of economic value and economic value exchange more directly just with sort of software on their phone or, 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 or apps that they're interacting with. And, um, the traditional tightly controlled, uh, you know, all around the world, every country with its own tightly controlled government run, government monopolized currency, um, you know, more more people and businesses are trying to seek ways to participate in other economic systems. Basically, vote with their smartphone, as I like to say. Um, and you know, it, it kind of ties back to the role of the dollar. My my view is is more aligned with your view, which is that I actually think um, these technological shifts, which will make you know the the form factor of 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 a dollar you know be this kind of you know digital you know digital currency instrument that can be widely widely used and and can scale with network effects and 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 ease over the form factor of the internet as a medium of exchange actually is a tremendous opportunity for sort of strengthening that but it's also it also does seem to imply that other uh, other currencies will become weaker and less less valuable and less used, and there's there's ultimately going to be more um, tension around that in 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 parts of the world um, because kind of internet scale technologies uh, kind of crowd out uh, oftentimes, and they have in communications and information and in data and media, and they, they crowd out the sort of tightly controlled proprietary local things. Um, and currency is just one of those. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. We have we have two internets basically. There's there's the world's internet, and then there's the Chinese internet. And then right. you know, and there, and we're probably going to wind up. I can definitely see a world where we wind up with two sort of. Well, we already have two payment systems, you know, in in the world with, yeah, you know, credit cards and, and all of that kind of stuff, and then China with mm -hmm. WeChat and Alipay. Um, and, and that bifurcation, I think is, is real. There's not a lot of space for a third or a fourth or a fifth that, you know, you're like having like Swiss coin, you know, who's going <laughs> to care about that. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I think, um, in, in this kind of the, the role of the dollar, um, our, our, our premise is, you know, there's a technological competition that's happening for currencies. That's actually real. Um, and there's, there's a worldview, which is, I, I think the Chinese worldview, which is that technology competition is going to largely be state sponsored and have embedded, uh, value systems in it and, and or embedded political control mechanisms in it. And that's an expression, a technology expression of, uh, uh, uh of a, of a, of a political and economic system. And, you know, the, the, the West has, and the U S has some explicit choices to make about what, what value systems they want in that, 
in that world of of dollar digital currency. But um, right. I want to. Start- we have to remember, just like you know, just to stick one more beat on this, that the dollar system and the power of the dollar comes in very large part from what you call scalability, and the way that the dollar scales is through fractional reserve banking. You know, it's banks who create the dollar, and it's banks who are at the heart of the global payment system right now. And to the degree that the role of US regulated banks becomes diminished in some future global payments structure, you are also diminishing their ability to create money and to scale dollars. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, um, I'm very interested in in um, how credit intermediation happens in the future and the possibilities of credit intermediation um, that that can be performed in a in a in a lower risk way with less embedded leverage uh, that could be safer and and more um, recession resilient um, and and also allow for extremely high velocity money as well. So think about that a lot, um, uh, actually. Uh, um, I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I do want to pivot to another, um, to another topic, which, which builds off of this, which is, uh, I'm really interested in and, and I captured your interest in it as well, which was, um, kind of this belief that coming out of all this, that the world needs new, I, I'll use a phrase, mechanism design in terms of how collaboration and problem solving and, and organization works. And, um, uh, the, the, there were a, a, a number of references ar- around, um, you know, around this that our collective efforts like have to shift. Um, obviously, like there's the obvious stuff like, okay, wow, we've got generative AI. We better figure that out. That's like a collective effort thing or, or, or obviously the, the climate crisis is a collective effort thing or, you know, there's a number of those kind of collective effort things. Um, but I, I'm thinking about this, and I think I captured a little bit of, of this from you as well, which is at a micro level, like, how do we, as these new virtual workers and in this new distributed world and in this new, more digitally native world, like, h- how does organization of, of, of work and output and other things happen? And my own belief is that there's going to be, we're, in a, in, we're entering a new era, and there's going to be a lot of experimentation, and, and we're going to see new kind of organizational forms and corporate forms and other things emerge out of this. And I, I'd love to hear you talk a Absolutely. little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is profound. And I think we saw two very interesting um, collective action uh, instances or examples over the course of the pandemic. The first one, of course, was March, April 2020, which was the really big one, when the entire planet just stopped. Everyone went into lockdown. We all just went into our homes. All of the supply chains broke. All of those dynamic equilibria spun out of control and ground to a halt. And the global economy just fell off a cliff. And we did that um, collectively, all of us playing our part by staying home and not going out in the world and not touching each other and not interacting with each other physically in order to buy ourselves buy ourselves time bend the curve yeah give ourselves the ability to develop vaccines and therapeutics and collectively basically go to war against this microscopic yeah. virus and that was astonishing to behold and we haven't really seen the world come together that way ever yeah. before and the way we did that was was quite stunning um and that gave me some hope that yeah. maybe right. we will be able to do that for other things and specifically for climate change. Um, the other one, which is smaller, but also extremely interesting, was the way that investing became a social phenomenon, mm-hmm. a genuinely social phenomenon for the first time ever. And you wound up actually getting wars, you know, well, maybe not wars, but certainly battles yes. break out, um, you know, between, <laughs> you know, Wall Street bets on the ones on the one right. hand, the and, and the versus of, the hedge funds came and the hedge funds on the other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you saw this, you saw investing turned into a game where 
playing the game was the thing that mattered. And winning was great, but losing was also thrilling. And it wasn't this kind of instrumentalist, I need to invest money in order to secure my retirement thing, so much as it was, this is a fun game that I am playing with a bunch of people on the internet. Yeah. Um, which started in stocks, but rapidly moved into NFTs, which were increasingly designed not to be quote unquote art, but rather to be yeah. social and to create these communities and often communities of exactly 10,000 people, because that seemed to be the sweet spot where, you know, it was small enough that you, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted to get in, but couldn't. And so that would increase the price and that all of these kind of dynamics. Um, and so, yeah, the sort of, so the, the way that kind of, um, way in which social media and money really came together for the first time was mm -hmm. astonishing to behold. And I don't think is we're going to be able to put that toothpaste yeah. back in the tube. Yeah. You also had the phenomenon of, uh, you know, DAOs, which was, you know, essentially like, hey, I, 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 <laughs> oh, right. I, so, yeah, the DAOs is all, I mean, tied the, in, right? it's yeah, all tied in, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. The DAOs were perfectly, and 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 the one that really caught the imagination of the public was the Constitution DAO, right. which, in a glorious example of the new not normal and the unpredictability of everything, after it had utterly failed in its stated aim of buying yeah. a copy of the U.S. Constitution. The value of the governance tokens in the constitution now only went up and up and up. And it, and they became this like speculative currency. Right. And what are you do with the money? Right. Right. And, 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 and everyone's like, value. Yeah. and you could, you could buy into the constitution now, lose the constitution and then sell your governance tokens at a hundred X profit. And you're like, wow, what is this world? Where right. Yeah. No, the, 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 there's some, nuttiness obviously <laughs> uh clearly clearly but i i think like i i think about this at a more at a more micro level which is um in in a you know in, in a in a globalized world that where everyone is sort of connected in in through these new mediums and where you have the ability to create structures where you have um a, a effectively kind of um ownership participation governance like these are you know the un the underlying infrastructure that's there and this is sort of on-chain infrastructure didn't exist before that you didn't have a, an internet native infrastructure where you could actually have um you know ownership a treasury governance voting uh and 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 value exchange kind of all mediated by software entirely and 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 where participation uh and ownership and decisions were all kind of mathematically provable uh, with counterparties anywhere in the world that are connected to the internet. That to to me is is a really big breakthrough, and I don't think we're done with the experimentation there. There's the nutty stuff, um, but but there's also uh, a, a way in which you know social, political, economic organization um, are are also an outgrowth of technological capabilities. Whether it was you know the you know the the broadcast media and its relationship to how that drove democratic participation, all these kinds of things. So I, I, I'm, I'm personally, um, is sort of interested in the way in which, um, people around the world will use this technology to come together to solve problems, organize capital, uh, conduct work, um, and, and, and do that on a supranational scale, um, that, you know, again, just, Technologically, it wasn't straightforward to do, but now we have a kind of substrate that's emerging where you can start to do these. They'll press up against obviously legal reality. They'll press up against the, 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 you know, the, the laws of the, of the local government. You can go to the extreme biology's network state, um, kind of, kind of, uh, uh, thesis, but, um, but, but even, even more mundane, just, you know, how do we, how do we organize collectively to achieve an outcome, whether it's, producing something or, or, or organizing, uh, et cetera, and, and using this technology to do that. Yeah, exactly. And, and the dream of being able to connect with like-minded people around the world in furtherance of some common aim mm -hmm. was one that 
definitely got turbocharged during the pandemic and you could see people using various different discords mm -hmm. and reddits and yeah. DAOs and all the rest of it to do that and that dream is is not going to die that and right. the way that we all communicated with each other for most of 2020 was via these mm -hmm. screens and using these networks and even if it's just you know a a, a group text thread you yeah. know uh the way that we um interact with other humans has become much more intermediate and much more virtual and that is going you're absolutely right it's going to have a profound effect on the way we think about the way that we construct organizations and yeah. the dominant organization of the past century has been the corporation and specifically yeah. the limited liability corporation yeah. which you know has lots of wonderful things to be said for it, but there are alternatives and we're going to see more of those alternatives. Yeah. 100% agree. Um, and and uh, I, I, I believe that will be an on-chain future. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, lo a lot of exciting stuff. I'll, I'll leave with uh, one, one kind of thought, which is I think um, your book uh, came out uh, before the past few months of explosive generative AI and generative AI has obviously now captured the, the, the popular imagination. And, um, and it, it is, it is one of those things which has been both expected, but unexpected. And it's, and, and it's compounding nature is certainly unexpected for the vast majority of people that are out there. And I, I'm just interested, just given the broader thesis of your book, uh, and, and the like is, um, how you think about um, the the disruptions, changes uh, that that are unexpected, but, but maybe right. we have a, 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 a clear view on now. Well, it's definitely not a clear view. Like the the one thing yeah. we know about this is is there's a lot of muddiness and a lot of known unknowns, um, and yeah. there is a, an enormously broad spectrum of people looking at generative AI from saying like. Um, I guess there are three corners where you could find yourself. Um, one is saying like, it's kind of a nothing burger. It's a party trick. Um, one is saying that it is going to cause the extinction of every human on the planet. And one is saying that it's going to be the greatest productivity enhancement the world has ever seen. And we're all just going to become, you know, in incredibly rich and productive and, and thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and all three of them, you know, you can, I have seen all three argued. Um, my gut feeling, and this is just me being a gut feeling and not, not having any particular expertise on the matter, is that we might actually surprise ourselves on the nothing burger side of things. The AI is potentially extremely powerful, both to the upside and to the downside, but the generative AI in particular might turn out to be a little bit of a dead end. Um, and the AI is one of these things that kind of goes many, many years without kind of like spinning its wheels and going nowhere. And then suddenly it invents something new and everyone gets very excited. And then it, and then that kind of plateaus for a while and then we go nowhere. And then suddenly a new form of AI comes along. And I'm not convinced that the large language models are actually the sort of be all and end all of like where you know it's not really intelligence it's it's not artificial intelligence by any you know by, by the way i think of it i do think it can be a marginal productivity enhancement i don't think it's going to cause the extinction of the planet um but it is definitely one of those uh volatility events right that it will it has the ability to create both massive upsides and massive downsides. And that's exactly what the book is about, is that yeah. these things will come along, they will surprise us, and we need to be ready for them when they when they arrive. Yeah. Well, you're helping us be ready, Felix. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm appreciative and appreciative of you coming on and chatting about it all uh, here today. It's been fun. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome, Felix.